So today, today we got a few things to do, um, which I don't have 21. We will finish up lab 21 also. Lab 24 will be our first day of measuring our plants. So you will measure, take data, you're going to mark them, and we'll talk about that in lab. Water spray, your variable tray only. You'll finish up lab 22, we'll do a little peer review together, talk about that more. And then don't forget, please, please don't forget, if you're planning on graduating this semester, make sure you get that petition in today. Today's the due, due date. So if you don't get that in today, you do not graduate in the spring semester, end of the spring semester. So please get that done. Again, homework, working on your objectives. Don't forget, this is it. This is our last class before the exam on Tuesday. So you really, at this point, you really need to be reviewing and quizzing yourself. Review, quiz, review, quiz. One of the best things to do is hand those objectives to somebody else and have them quiz you. Have them grab random ones and just like ask you questions and you explain. The best way to ease your test anxiety is to be able to explain all of this information to someone else. When you can explain it or teach it to someone else, then you're like, I got this. It builds a huge amount of confidence. So please don't forget that step of that quizzing and explaining. And just the fact of like explaining it to someone, hearing yourself talk out loud, even if you're doing it with yourself, talk out loud. It'll help you to remember things better. Don't forget, exam, 50 questions, 53 questions, three extra credit, any three are extra credit, multiple choice, study your diagrams, pictures, graphs, study everything in your notebook. My notebook goes with the objectives. So if you're like, well, I wonder what we're gonna be tested on, the notebook. The notebook covers all the objectives. Anybody, any questions about the exam? Okay. So Tuesday, you'll do your exam. When you come into the exam, you'll put your objectives up here. If you've been doing your objectives in a notebook or note cards, just make sure your notebook, you put it up here. I'll give it back to you when you're done with your exam. If you have note cards, just bundle them together, maybe a rubber band or put them in a plastic bag. Put your name on the first one, stick them up here. Otherwise, put them up here. Um, if you've been doing them electronically and you've been like writing them out electronically, you can either show me your device, you can just show it to me on your device after the exam, or you can upload it. Sometimes the uploads are too big. So um, whatever works, we'll figure out a way. After the exam, when you're done, you'll just go into 121 and you'll do your day five measurement. All right. Oh, and then I sent this out yesterday. Um, we have an amazing club. I know everybody's involved in STEM in here. It is really fun. I've had so many students in the past come back and be like, I'm so glad I joined that. Professor, well, I should say Dr. Deanne DeShaw, uh, she's super cool, and she makes all kinds of great events through the STEM Club. You could see some of the examples up there. Lots of opportunities for you to not only connect with your peers who are interested in STEM, but also to be exposed to a lot of different fields. And these things are, <clears throat> excuse me, these things are all really great resume builders, nice things to put on there. Um, your colleges and universities want to see not only are you a great student, but that you were involved with your school in many ways. And this is one of the greatest ways to do it is through STEM Club. You'll also learn about internship opportunities, local opportunities that you could benefit from by being in the STEM Club. And um, like I said, it's a really, it's really fun. Dr. Deanna Shah makes it a really great opportunity. So please consider doing that. They meet on Mondays at, I can't remember if it's three or 3.30, but please consider. And I sent this to you all last night through Canvas. So it's in your announcements on Canvas. You can just click on this and um, you'll get into the STEM Canvas shell and then they'll, you'll get all the announcements and information there.
Let's talk about the history of life and human evolution. First, we're going to talk about Okay, we're starting here. The origin and history of life. Before life was around, there had to be something for life to be on, grow on, flourish on. What we call that is prebiotic evolution. Anytime you see the word B-I-O, it means living thing, and pre means before. So when we're talking about prebiotic evolution, we're talking about evolution of the earth, of the environment, of all of the things that life needed to flourish. So prebiotic evolution, again, means evolution before pre-life bio. We had to have some changes that had to happen so that life could exist. On early Earth, there were a lot of inorganic molecules and a few small organic molecules. Every semester, I forget to change this. Methane is a very small organic molecule. The rest of these are inorganic. The definition of organic molecule is that you have a carbon that has hydrogens attached to it. So again, methane is a very small organic molecule. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to change that. We had all kinds of stuff there, but one of the things that we did not have on early Earth was no free oxygen. And what I mean by free oxygen is how we breathe in O2 right now. That's what we would consider free oxygen. It's oxygen that's free of any other atoms. We did have oxygen that was incorporated into some molecules like water, for example, but it is connected to something else, so it's not considered free oxygen. The Earth formed about between 3.9 and even like 4.4 billion years ago. I do not, when you go through your objectives and you're studying for the exam, I don't want you to know the dates. I mean, I think general, like just this one, I would star just to know how old the earth is. That one's kind of important, but I want, um, I don't want you to memorize the dates of which everything happened, even though I have it listed on there, but I do want you to know the order that um, evolution happened in. So when we go from like earth to the first cells to membrane, or sorry, member, oh, I'm, I'm getting out of order now, but um, so order, order of events. So just know the order of events. You don't have to know the dates, but know the order that events happened in. So as we go through this lecture, um, Make sure you know this came and this came and this came and this came and how things build in. The Earth, they believe, is formed by a bunch of meteorites smashing into each other and then orbiting around the sun. Primitive Earth was very different than it was now, than it is now. Primitive Earth looked like this. There was a lot of activity happening, like lava flows. There were volcanoes, and there was a ton of lightning strikes and meteors crashing. Early Earth was covered in water. So now we have, uh, I don't know, 70% of the Earth's surface is water, right? And 30% about is land. Um, it was almost kind of closer to maybe like 95% or 90% water. So there was a lot more water. It looked something like this. Liquid or water was very available. Knowing something about water and biology, water is super important to the making and breaking of molecules. So water being widely available is a really important step in working toward living things because we know that our bodies are made mostly of water. 
when we make organic molecules, we need water. When we break organic molecules, we need water. So water is, is a good situation, having a lot of water and having a lot of energy sources to stimulate molecules to mix around together makes for a really good situation for life to happen. So here's what they believe in doing research and simulations how life may have started. Notice the words I'm using, may have started. These are hypotheses about the way life could have occurred. We don't have any data, we don't have any information, fossils, any records that show this is how life started because no, nobody was there. So again, this is the hypothesis part of evolution where we think like, well, these conditions made for a good situation for life to come about. Remember, as I said on the first day of class, no one is challenging how you, if you have a specific belief and how life started, science isn't challenging that. It's just saying this is like through scientific methods how we think it may have started. So when you take a bunch of small inorganic molecules and you add water and electrical or uh, energy sources to it, you could get them to combine in ways to make things like this so that you could get amino acids, which are the basic monomers of the proteins. And we could combine those inorganic molecules in many different ways to show that they could make other important structures like ATP and carbohydrates, fats, nucleic acids, and then proteins. So there is this experiment that shows the possibility of how life could have started upon these prebiotic conditions. So they took oxygen out of the equation, no free oxygen in their simulation, and they added a whole bunch of inorganic molecules as well as small organic molecules, water vapor, and that they had energy sources fueling the movement of all of these things in this closed system. And after some time, what they found was small organic molecules were formed. So they went, mm, this is kind of like early Earth. And when we're talking about small organic molecules, we often call them monomers. And then those monomers come together in chains and they make polymers or complex organic molecules. And those polymers, again, as I mentioned before, are things like ATP and proteins and fats and nucleic acids. All of those bio molecules that could make up a living thing. Miller Ray did a bunch of different simulations, added different molecules to the simulation and found they could get a variety of almost anything that you find in a living thing. Also meteorites, as they're crashing from other places, they added more atoms, molecules to the system. If you've ever heard that term, we're all made of stars. That's because early Earth was made by meteorites crashing, came from outside of our universe or within our universe too. And we're made of molecules that weren't here before. This is a very simple system. So one of the nice things, and remember with evolution, we said that one of the key ideas about evolution is simple builds to complex. And that's kind of a principle of science or STEM in general, right? We start with simple and then we build, 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 build to make more complex. So here, what they started with was a pretty simple simulation to show the conditions and the complexity of early earth. So nothing very complex here. And slowly then the idea is, is that over time, these molecules combine and simple molecules to more complex molecules too simple living things to more complex living things. They thought life would be in areas where water met the shoreline and where there might be small pockets that could get dense amounts of molecules in there and then 
you have lightning strike or volcanic activity or whatever other kind of energy source might act upon these little small protected watery areas and life would have maybe formed here. Uh, this is a tide pool. This is kind of, if you've ever seen a shoreline next to water and there's just these smaller like protected pools. That's what they think that life started in was something like a tide pool. So what they call this little mishmash of stuff in those protected areas is they've named it the primordial soup. So first cells. There's a lot of hypotheses about how the first cells came about. Still to this day, there are scientists who are studying models to argue, maybe this is how it happened. Maybe this is how it happened. Maybe this is how it happened. So the conversation goes on and on. Showing examples like miller Urey gives us the idea that we're here just like mutations occur totally by chance that it was just all of these optimum conditions in the same place at the same time and poof here comes life we're going to put the idea of the formation of earth and life into a 24-hour clock so that if this were 24 hours and we're talking about from the first rocks making the earth to the first organisms and then moving from these simple organisms through time to more complex organisms and thinking about current day where we live that we could see that from the first rocks forming or the earth forming to the first organisms there wasn't a ton of time that those first organisms, which we'll talk about as prokaryotes or single-celled simple organisms came about. But then those prokaryotes are on the earth for a really long time, over a billion years before more complex organisms come about. And then once we have these first simple complex organisms or eukaryotes, then we start to get a lot more evolution happening to us. We've only been on the earth for a very, very short period of time in the grand scheme of evolution. So let's talk a little bit about the first living things. The first living things are believed to have been prokaryotes. Pro means no or before. Pro means no or before. Karyotic, right, good, nucleus. Karyote nucleus. Karyotic means a cell with a nucleus. So if you see the terms karyote, it means a cell that does not have a nucleus. If we're talking about a prokaryotic cell, it's an adjective. That means that cell does not have a nucleus. So um, same thing, just different forms of the word. So prokaryotic cells, no nucleus. Very simple in structure. They were anaerobic. Aerobic means oxygen. So if you're ever doing aerobic exercise, you're breathing more oxygen faster. Aerobic, oxygen, and means no or without. Remember that early earth, we said that there was no free oxygen so that these organisms are thriving and surviving in an atmosphere where they were not breathing oxygen to help break down their food. They were doing it and aerobically, they're breaking down their food without oxygen. One of the things that we do know about that, if we're talking about cellular respiration, cellular respiration with oxygen is a lot, lot, lot more efficient at helping us to break down our food. Our cells are tiny, tiny, tiny little things. So you can't take a cheeseburger and just be like, here, cells, eat this cheeseburger, right? You got to break it down into all the small, small, small from that polymer parts to the monomer parts. And then those monomer parts go into cellular respiration where they get broken down into even smaller packets of energy called ATP. So when we're talking about aerobic respiration, breaking down our food, 
with oxygen, we get a lot more little ATPs for our cells. Anaerobically, we get a lot, lot, lot less, a lot. It does still break down food. So there's some benefit to anaerobic respiration. You get to keep going, right? You get to break down some food. But there's a lot of bad things associated with that too. Is one is that you get only a little bit of packets of energy. The rest of it's lost as heat and also made into byproducts that are often toxic to the organism or not healthy for it. So this, they survived on it, but we're going to see it's going to get better, but not for like another billion years. So anaerobic respiration. Eventually there were mutations that occurred to these anaerobic organisms, and they began to have mutations that coded for chloroplast-like molecules. But again, this is like a billion years after the start of those first organisms. And when you get these little organelle-like structures that function like chloroplasts, they have the ability to capture energy from the sun and make food, glucose, other things that go into metabolic pathways. And then eventually having that ability to photosynthesize leads to a greater amount of food. And then there's also a mutation where you get a mitochondria-like organelle, and then that can take the products of this photosynthesis and help to make us those more efficient packets of energy. So those cyanobacteria are these first hypothetical cells that were able to photosynthesize. They had some kind of photosynthetic-like structure all occurred by a chance mutation. If you are a single cell and you have this chance mutation for having a structure that's similar to a chloroplast, you have a huge advantage, right? You're suddenly selected for, because you can use sunlight and carbon dioxide and water, and you can make oxygen that can help to more efficiently break down your food and you're making your food. So you've got two big advantages here. Photosynthesis evolution started around 3.5 billion years ago. So like I'm saying about a billion years after the earth was created and the first cells came about. Here's the other thing about oxygen. So we know today oxygen is great because it helps us to more efficiently break down our food sources. But back then, oxygen was toxic to a lot of organisms. So we've got a lot of mutations that are by chance happening here is that you get those photosynthesis-like structures. And then you also have to have a mutation that allows you to withstand being in an oxygen atmosphere. Because again, oxygen wasn't around, it was toxic. So we get some nice mutations that are happening. And what we know, as I just said, aerobic, sorry, did I miss? Okay, yeah, yeah. Did you miss something? Oh, questions. Poop, thanks. <laughs> okay, sorry, I don't know where my questions went. Um, as Let's go back to that question on page 109. Thank you so much. Um, as a result of the cyanobacteria undergoing photosynthesis, what did they put in the atmosphere? Good. Oxygen. Correct. Correct. Good. And then, um, and then at the bottom, aerobic metabolism is an advantage over anaerobic metabolism. Because which one? Do we like A the best? Yeah, A looks good, right? That, as I've been saying, that when you have oxygen, you can more efficiently break down things like glucose. But remember, when we're talking about photosynthesis, the product of glucose is just a placeholder for that going into other metabolic pathways to make all of the food, not just glucose. So let's go back to here. Please remind me if there's questions, because I am sorry, I don't know why my questions are missing. So oxygen built up. We got that, got that. 
And as we just said, aerobic respiration allows cells to be more efficient at making glucose into ATP, at making other molecules which go into aerobic respiration, your fats, your proteins, your carbohydrates, all funnel into cellular respiration at some point. And what we want to get is we want to get a lot more of those little ATPs for our cells. So here again, look at this term, selected organisms, right? If you have the ability or the you have the mutation for the ability to efficiently break down your food, you are selected for or favored in that environment. There's also a mutation next, about 2 billion to 1.7 billion years ago. B Y, sorry, B Y A means billion years ago. If you were like, well, what does that mean? Sorry about that. Billion years ago. If we have M Y A, it's million years ago. So it took a while for membranes to come about. Membranes are really important because they give an extra protective coating. Membranes allow some molecules in, and membranes allow for blocking some molecules from not coming in. So when we talk about selective permeability of membranes, that means that you can better protect and regulate what comes in and out of the cell. So membranes are a really great mutation to have. Let's talk about how this may have occurred. So what they believe happened is what is called endosymbiont theory. This is an example. You have the illustration of endosymbiont theory. Probably write that down. Endosymbiont theory says that we have a cell that is a predator cell. So you've got this cell who's going around and is really good at eating other cells. And now that cell comes up to a cell that has the mutations to be able to take food with oxygen and make a lot of those little ATPs. And so then this big cell's like, hey, I can eat you. And this one's like, no, no, don't eat me. Guess what? I have this really great ability to take your food and make good food for your cells. So you don't have to go around eating as much. You could be lazy. And then the cell's like, hmm. It's like, just let me live inside of you. So boop. So then they become symbiotic. And instead of eating the cell, it engulfs the cell and incorporates it into its body so that this cell who can undergo aerobic respiration now is working together with the big cell to make more efficient packets of energy for them both. Then cells like, all right, I got to eat, got to go eat more. This isn't giving me all my energy needs. And it comes upon another small cell, but that small cell has the ability to photosynthesize. And so when it comes upon this little cell, the cell's like, hey, I can do this thing called photosynthesis where I could take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide that you're breathing out anyway, and I can turn it into your food. And then my products can go to our other friend here who can process that into little packets of energy for all our cells. So now you could be super duper duper lazy because I can make the energy and they can process it efficiently. And so that's how they believe that organelles came about, was that these specialized kind of cells were given homes inside of larger cellular organisms to create these very specialized organelles. Eventually, about 1.7 billion years ago, you get the first eukaryotic cells where you have... Oh, question, thank you. Okay, uh, which of the following would be an advantage for multicellularity?
What do you think? Yeah, so those are all good things, right? So you have a lot, having more complexity gives you a lot more abilities for your survival. Excellent. And then about a half a billion years later, after eukary oh, so let me just mention this in eukaryotic cells. One of the important things here in terms of organelles was that before membranes, your genetic material, material whether you had DNA or RNA, was floating around inside your cell or was attached at a point in your cell that was exposed to anything inside of your cell. With a membrane like a nuclear envelope, you could encapsulate your genetic material to protect it better. So having eukaryotic cells where you've got everything not only has membranes, but your genetic material is in a membrane and it's better protected, and we call that a eukaryotic organism. U, E-U, means true, karyotic nucleus. So now what we consider a true nucleus is having your genetic material protected inside of a membrane. So that's really good. Just gives you an extra step of what you can like regulate your DNA to go out into the cytoplasm where you can inside of your organelle, you can have a transcript made of your DNA and your DNA never even goes out into the cytoplasm and is exposed to other things in the cell that you can send an RNA transcript, we call that mRNA out there. And so we have a lot more control over our genetic material. About half billion year later, we get some simple animals. I should say organisms in general. Sorry. I have pictures of animals. So as we mentioned below in the, or before in that question that there's a lot of advantages to being more complex, there's also a lot of advantages to living together with another group of cells what we call colonies. So evolution goes from cells who have membranes to eukaryotic cells, and then those small eukaryotic cells live together in a group that we call a colony. And like you, if you have roommates, you live in a house with a bunch of family members, or you have a bunch of friends you live together with, one of the good things about that is that you can separate all of the tasks into different people, right? So that maybe one week you're like, I'm going to clean the bathroom this week. You're going to clean the kitchen. You're going to go to the grocery store. And all the tasks that you would normally have to do all by yourself, you could pass out to different members of your colony or your group. And so it makes life a lot easier. Eventually what happens is those cellular colonies had mutations where they could stick together and all of those different specialized tasks that individual cells were doing started to become things like tissues and organs. So very similar to our endosymbiont theory where the cells came together, the cell came to get the organelles. Here we have colonies of cells where cells are specializing and becoming one group or organism. Other things that are good about it, if you live in a group, it's hard for a predator to eat a whole bunch of you. You look bigger you're stronger as a group. So you can fight off predators and they can't eat you. And then again, mention the specialization of cells. The first animals were very simple and they looked like things like sponges, jellyfish, or protists, like algae here. Mushrooms, simple plants. So now we're at the first animals. We've kind of skipped over all the other great organisms there. Many other organisms were evolving, as I mentioned, like things that were able to photosynthesize on a larger scale or bigger organisms that could photosynthesize, like algae, and you start to get mushroom-like things and other protist-like things, plant-like things, and we also get the first animals. Animals did not come about until a billion years ago. Remember this, remember, star this so that you have it in your head. The first animals evolved in water. Sometimes when there's a question and I say, put these in the right order, and I say, when did animals first evolve? You'll often put them after 
organisms made it onto land. But remember, animals started in water. So just as a little reminder. And eventually we get simple invertebrates, those animals that don't have a spinal column, and then eventually, eventually we get vertebrates. And eventually then we get mammals, and eventually we get primates, and then humans. So land invasion, land invasion only happened about 400 million years ago. So this whole like evolution of things on land is really new in terms of evolution. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why would it be good and bad to be on land? So let's look at the cons first. When you live in water, so let's think about a jellyfish. If you're a jellyfish and you're all this like 95% water thing and you're just like bloop, bloop, bloop in your water and then you take a jellyfish and you put it on land, what's going to happen to the structure of that jellyfish? Is it gonna look like what it looked like in water anymore? No, it's gonna look like a hunk of jello. It's gonna be like gooey because gravity, does it push or pull? Which one? Pull. pull? Okay. So gravity pulls on organisms. I always confuse that. Gravity pulls on organisms. That pulling on organisms, it's a lot of pressure. And so something that looks really beautiful in water now just looks like a hunk of jello on land. Gravity is very hard to deal with. So you need structures that can allow you to stand up to gravity. It's one of the mutations in our body of bones that makes us have a huge advantage to living on land is that we've got a whole skeleton or structure to keep us in our form with gravity. That's why over time, as you get older, things start to hurt because you can only handle it so long. Gravity's a lot. So gravity is not for everybody. If you were able to just absorb water, you had osmosis easily happening because you're surrounded by water. So that means that your cellular functions needing water all the time, easy, because you just go to be like, right? On land, there's not water available everywhere. So that was really hard. Sunlight, which we know to be a great thing, but what if you get too much sunlight? Is that bad? Oh yeah, right? UV rays are harmful. So you had to figure out how am I going to be on land and give myself times when I could get out of the sun. So not necessarily the best things, but let's talk about, oh, and then reproduction. If you were able to just like spew your sperm and eggs into the water and they stay nice and moist and hydrated, now you got to figure out how to do that, how to distribute or get your sperm and egg together without water. Okay, so now let's talk about, you go to land though and nobody else is there. There's not a lot of competition. So that makes things a lot better. So remember, and I, you might want to write competition here is that there's not a lot of competition. So it makes life less stressful. We know that evolution favors those with less competition. The first land plants. Now remember in the water, we had things like algae who could photosynthesize as well as other kind of plant-like things in the water. The first land plants came about about 475 million years ago. They had to have waterproof coatings, which we still see today. Plants are a little bit shiny because they're covered in thin, or if we're talking about desert plants, thick layers of wax. And that wax makes you, I was gonna say undehydratable, but that's not the word, makes you uh, able to keep your water inside. Specialized tissues evolve, and we'll talk about this in the next unit, where you have tubes, which we call vascular tissue in plants. Just like we have vascular tissue, we have arteries and veins and smaller tubes in our body that transport stuff around. So you had these eventual mutations for the efficient conduction of your water and your food and other molecules. Reproduction changes so that you have Things like seeds come about so that your embryos 
are encapsulated in a shell to protect them from dehydrating. Just like your peas that you planted, those had embryos inside of them. And so they break from their that outer coating when you put them in the right conditions. We soaked them and then you put them in moist soil and then they germinated or broke open. And eventually we have flowers, which flowers are used to attract pollinators so that you could have somebody who takes your gametes and transplants them from flower to flower to flower. On our way to the vertebrates, so our early vertebrates, like fishes, began to come onto land and had mutations where they could walk a little bit. They have what are called lobe fins or front fins. And their front fins, they use like little walking legs. And so they put their fins down and they walked around. So what they could do is they could crawl with those front fins from tide pool to tide pool and stay moist and hydrated in that way. They also had these stomach sacs that functioned in a way to capture oxygen like a lung. And we believe that lungs eventually came from that. There was no other larger organisms on land, so they had no competitors for eating. Eventually what happens is we see improvements over time to legs and arms and lungs, and we make for the higher organisms in terms of animals. So then we have mutations that lead us to the amphibians. There's a couple of things that still hold true today with amphibians and their relationship to water. Amphibians have lungs, but they are very simple. Because they have very simple lungs, they are not efficient enough that they had a favorable mutation simultaneously that allows them to breathe through their skin. So amphibians, they need, and one of the things about respiratory surfaces is that all respiratory surfaces need to be moist in order for the diffusion of very small gases to come across a membrane. So their skin being a respiratory surface, they have to keep their skin moist at all times. So amphibians, if you've ever like kept an amphibian or thought if you're thinking about, oh yeah, if I'm going to have amphibians, I've got to have little pools of water. And some of them live directly in water their whole life. But also you have to keep it really humid. You have to have a very humid environment to keep amphibians. The other connection that we see is that amphibians still lay their eggs in water and their eggs are jelly-like sacs that could get easily dehydrated. Let's look at the structure of an amphibian embryo. Does it look like a fish? Yeah, so here we have a really great evolutionary visual connection between the amphibians and the fish. And also the other thing about amphibian embryos is that they're born with gills, that they have gills. And eventually those gills start to recess and you start to get the formation of lungs. It's one of the many things that are happening when you have the metamorphosis of going from an embryo to an adult. The other thing is that they have this tail. Eventually the tail goes away. They don't have, they're not born with arms and legs and they start to butt out arms and legs and they start to change their lungs. So we really see this transition between the fish-like animal to the amphibian-like animal in their early life stages. Then you have mutations that give rise to the reptiles and with reptiles, they're able to withstand drier conditions for a couple of reasons. One is that their eggs, instead of being jelly-like, have coatings on them that are leather-like. And those leather-like coatings allow the embryos to stay hydrated. And the embryos then, which we call the eggs, they do not, the embryos inside of the eggs, they do not need to sit in water. They can stay on land. The other couple things about amphibians is that they have scales and the scales 
they act a lot like the wax coating that plants have. It helps them to stay hydrated. It makes a protective hydration barrier. Another mutation that occurs is that their lungs become more efficient. This dry, scaly skin cannot respire. So you have two simultaneously, simultaneous mutations for the dry, waterproofing skin. But since you can't breathe through dry skin as a respiratory surface, you get these enhanced lungs. And then eventually reptiles give rise to the birds and mammals, or have, I should say, have a common ancestor with the birds and mammals. Mutations for feathers and hair or fur allow for mammals to be able to withstand living outside of the sunny days where it's warm. So they can take advantage of being the term we call nocturnal, which is active at night. So they can live in a colder environment. And that's great. It's a huge advantage because now you're going to lessen your competition so nobody's active at night because everybody gets cold at night and they have to go be warm and sleep at night. Whereas you could stay out later and you could go hunting later because you have feathers or fur that allow you to withstand the colder evenings. The other thing that happens is that we have a change up in terms of our metabolism that we see with this common ancestor between the reptiles and the birds and the mammals is that the metabolism changes. Um, if you saw in the lab, I crossed it off when you looked at Archaeopteryx, which was a transition animal between the birds and the reptiles, was that it had terms endothermic and exothermic that you could choose from, but I crossed them off because I'm, you can't see that happening on a fossil. The term exothermic means that you are constantly losing heat to your environment. And so reptiles one of the things that they do for their own survival is that during the day they go out and when they get up and the sun comes up, they go out and they do this and they sun themselves. What they're doing is they're capturing heat back into their body through the environment because all night they're losing heat from their body. We have a mutation for endothermic metabolism and endothermic means that you can keep heat inside of your body. And so that the birds and mammals have the ability to, through the processing of their food and just their daily activities, the heat that's given off from biochemical reactions, instead of losing that constantly to the environment, they can hold that inside their body. And we know that we call that our homeostasis of our temperature, that our body temperature hangs around 98 degrees, 98 point something, and that we can maintain that level temperature, which allows us to not have to take those times to stop and be like, oh, I, I can't, I'm just so sluggish and tired. I got to heat up. We keep our heat going through our endothermic metabolism. So insulation and that ability to maintain heat in your metabolism, huge survival advantages, great mutations, in relationship between the reptiles and then the birds and the mammals. All right, so just a couple things about birds. We said that we have temperature regulation. Birds have feathers, which also adds to that. Having that endothermic metabolism and feathers to keep you warm allows you to go into the night. And then also those feathers and mutations to the bones to make them have pockets of hollowness, make the bones lighter. And those two mutations can allow for birds to then fly and take advantage of a whole new environment. As I mentioned before, Archaeopteryx was a transition animal, meaning that you have an animal that has some bird characteristics and some reptile characteristics. And so this is what we might hypothetically call a common ancestor between the birds and the reptiles. And then you get the mammals. And mammals are very similar to birds in that they have the coverings, but instead of feathers, they have fur. And we also have that endothermic metabolism. 
the first mammals were really, really small. The first mammals came in during the dinosaur time. So a lot of people don't realize this, but they were teeny. And what they did, and because they could take advantage of living at night, when the dinosaurs, ah, the big giant dinosaurs are out during the day, you're just like a teeny little snack, right? They could snack on you. So during the day, you sleep. When the dinosaurs are all like, oh, sun's down, we're tired because we're just keep losing heat, dinosaurs go to bed and then you can come out and they're nocturnal or active at night. You can also, during the day, you can hide in places like trees or little holes underground. So you can really be away from them. And if you're in places like underground, you've got all these heating abilities to withstand that cold underground environment. So these are just some examples of what some of those first mammals might have looked like. Other things that were great mutation was that we have the ability to keep and grow our offspring inside of our bodies so that you didn't have to worry about like leaving your eggs somewhere like the dinosaurs had to do and then going off and foraging and getting food or doing whatever. Your embryo is like right there with you. It's growing inside of you. You can, you don't have to worry about like when it hatches to get it to feed it. It's all in here and it's being nourished and protected. And so that was a huge advantage with the mammals over the reptiles. Throughout evolution, we've had periods of what we call mass extinction. And for obvious reasons, right, you get the sudden disappearance of a lot, a lot, a lot of organisms at the same time. Mass meaning a lot, and then you get those extinctions. It's been a natural part of evolution. This is all driven by climate change. The climate drastically changed. And then a lot of things were not well adapted to that change and poof, they're gone. The worst mass extinction was about 245 million years ago, 90% of the world species went extinct. But, and dinosaurs hung in there for a while. Um, the, what they believe about the dinosaurs and the, the impetus for dinosaurs going extinct was that a huge meteorite hit the Yucatan Peninsula and it stirred up all kinds of dust. And then that dust coated our atmosphere and it blocked out sunlight from getting in. The dinosaurs were enormous. So we have to think about there's dinosaurs that are what we call herbivores who eat plants only. And then you had the omnivores who ate plants and other animals. Then you had the carnivores who predominantly ate animals. So we have, we're gonna see a chain effect that happens with this dust coating around our atmosphere. When sunlight was blocked from getting in, all these really big plants that the herbivore dinosaurs were eating, the plants start to die off because they're not getting enough sunlight. Now the herbivore dinosaurs are like, uh-oh, we're starving, and they start to die off. The omnivores go to eating the herbivores, but then when the herbivores are gone and there's only food, uh, animals left to eat, then you have the carnivores are starting to eat up all of the omnivores, and then eventually omnivores are gone, and then the carnivores are eating each other, and then the dinosaurs go extinct. But the little bits of sunlight that could filter in produce small plants. The mammals were around to survive on those small plants. Because the mammals were small, they could survive while the dinosaurs died off. What we call this, when you have a mass... Oh, wait. Uh, okay. Oh, so before I get there. Um, so again, climate change. Climate's always been changing. Climate change has always, always been happening. Did I miss a question? Okay, which, this is a great question. This is a very good question. A very, very good, good question, y'all. I like to, I, again, order. I wanna know the order that evolution happened in. So pick out the correct order that evolution happened in. You might wanna star this one.
Which one is the correct answer? Which one? Wait, say again louder. D as in dog? Okay. Good. Yeah, good, good. So there's that question where um, you need to recognize that the animals and land came before the land plants. So D is correct. Good, good. All right, climate change is always happening, always, always happening. I went through that, that we've always had the climate change happening. The way that we talked about evolution, continental drift, we talked about that in the um, first or second day of class, that everything was together. And as the continents are moving, that the organisms get separated. We have genetic drift happening, no gene flow. So we get new species that occur. When things happen, like dinosaurs go extinct, and the little mammals are there to be like, woo, we can come out. We got all this space now. There's all these dinosaurs that were in our way. They're dead. That's called adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation occurs right after a mass extinction so that a group that has the advantageous traits, now that the environment has totally changed, they can flourish. And here's the biggest thing. A lot of organisms die, so that reduces their competition. And again, we know that evolution favors organisms that have less competitors. All right, so here's our probably what our little first mammals look like. Okay, let's talk about our evolution. Yeah, this is it. This is it. All right, so a little bit about mammals. Remember, mammals, early mammals, small. Live birth was great. You could keep your babies inside of you growing. I should say fetuses inside of you, protect them. We have mammary glands. You can feed your offspring right there from your body. You don't have to go out and hunt. There's always exceptions. One of the things about biology is there's usually no hard, fast rules. These always do this. There are still some what we call monotremes that still lay eggs. They are considered mammals, but they lay eggs. So we do see that connection from the reptiles there to us. Uh, monotremes like the platypus, for example. Hair, again, we said allows us for greater activity. And when we have all of these great things like ability to protect our offspring inside of our body, and hair and fur and endothermic metabolism that leaves us a lot more time for surviving and thus for reproduction. And that's what evolution likes to see. Good survival, reproduction. So the primates, we're a primate. Early primates about 80 million years ago, hardly any time at all. Our common ancestor with all the primates only about 80 million years ago. So like nothing. They were those tiny, remember all those pictures, tiny little organisms, tiny little animals. They were probably originally, well, they were originally herbivores. There wasn't really anything they could hunt yet. They were probably nocturnal. I talked about all this already. They probably lived up in the trees or down in burrows, out of the way of the big giant dinosaurs. All right, we're gonna look at a bunch of characteristics that we still retain today that are linked to a common ancestor between all the primates. And we'll talk about how we got to mutations that allow us to look so different as what we would say modern humans from the rest of the primate group. So what is you're doing right now? You got grasping hands. You're holding your pens. Originally, that skill was used to climb up trees, to grasp onto tree bark. We have nails that, wow, we don't use them like, you know, mostly they're just pretty, I guess. But for the most part, nails were used for climbing, for ripping stuff open, right? Like an orange, you're going to use your nails to often rip them open. Um, but originally, our nails were used for climbing allowed us for very well-controlled actions. 
early ancestors might left might have left like a note that said, you know, if they're might have left a note like that, a precise action where they just put a few pictures of food to give the signal that I'm going out to get some food and coming back. So those precise actions there too. Precision grip writing, eventually sewing, making clothes, so that while we could go into colder environments, just by having our fur and our endothermic metabolism, what if we want to go even colder? We can make some clothing. We also have within your hands power grip. Power grip also for climbing. You got to be strong-handed to climb a tree, but then eventually we use that for getting food, is that you can take a rock and or you can throw a spear. Eyeballs. We have binocular vision. We have two eyes. By means two. Ocular eye. Remember that you looked at the way that or all the different animals looked at the world, whether it was forward or sideways? Like you have what we call peripheral vision, right? Because from our sideways, our forward-facing eyes, we can look pretty far sideways, but can you see behind you? No, because our eyes are facing forward, we can see like maybe to hear, but people can sneak up on you, right? Just like animals could sneak up on earliest humans or even today because you can't see behind you. So there are advantages to having eyes on the side. If you have sideways, sideways eyes, you can see all the way around. So our eyes are forward. We have overlapping fields of vision. What that does is it gives us very accurate depth perception. When you have eyes on the side, you might not be able to distinctly know exactly where things are right in front of you or right behind you because your field of vision isn't overlapping very well. Um, we can tell that we have that overlapping field of vision because if you take your like finger or pen and put it in front of you and you go like this, does it look like your finger moves a little bit? So that's your depth perception, right? Because one eye sees the finger here and one eye sees it there, but when you have them together, it sees it in the precise location. So that's good. We can see things exactly where they exist. That was really great when you were swinging from tree to tree so that you didn't just didn't smack into a tree because you didn't know exactly where the tree existed. It was good when you were picking fruit and had to like pick your fruit, fruit and run. So that was great. Um, color vision mutations eventually come along. Color vision is really great for choosing food that is ripe, knowing the difference between like a food that has like green or white fuzzy stuff on it or black fuzzy stuff from something that doesn't. So you could tell things that are moldy or poisonous. A lot of poisonous things have bright colors to them. So color vision really helped us with our survival as well. We got bigger brains, supposedly smarter. I don't know, in the very short time we're here, we're doing a real bang up job with the earth, aren't we? I don't know how smart that is. Brains support all kinds of these react these um, actions and processes that we have in our environment, in our bodies, as well as our brains will support the functioning of your organs and tissues to all work together. You can again see lots of real estate on the humans in comparison to other primates of our brain. So that makes us think we're smarter. And all these things are brain issues. Our brains allow us to have complex social interactions, which, you know, there's a lot of studies done today that say that our mental health relies on having actual human interaction and not just virtual human interaction. We do see complex social interactions among many animals in the animal kingdom who have either brain-like centers or actual brains. Uh, and then in connection with our brains, we have the foramen magnum, the insertion of the spinal cord into the skull. We know that for humans, it's straight up and down. It's under because we stand upright the first human ancestor to stand upright was Australopithecus. Remember that for lab today. 
and, I, and we'll get to Australopithecus in a second too. Uh, we were also bipedal. We became bipedal with our repositioning of our foramen magnum mutation. Bi means two. Pedal means feet. That we walk on two feet. So all primates can do it, but do all primates look natural when they do it? So when you have a gorilla or a chimpanzee or a monkey and they start running like this, don't they look a little crazy? They're like, right? So we can do it a little more elegantly. We can also see the position of the foramen magnum right underneath with the humans. And then with the gorilla, it is on an angle because their body is more like this. Check out the length of their arms, how long their arms have evolved to, to allow for a little bit of balancing off of their front arms. All right, so there's lots of hypotheses about why we're bipedal. I think a lot of these are like super duper obvious. So some of the reasons why, I, I like to say these are advantages to being bipedal. If you went out and you hunted and you got a bunch of great stuff and you were two-legged stooped and you needed to use your arms for balancing and then you had all this stuff to carry, how are you gonna bring all this great stuff back when you need like that for balance? But now if we're upright, we can just carry everything like this. Also, we could use our front arms more uh, specifically for tool making that we could write, we could sew, we could throw spears. We are taller, we could reach for food more easily. If you're like this, I can't see that far, but if I'm like this, well, I can see really far away. So being upright allowed us to see further, we could see if danger was around, we could see if there's food down there, lots of things that we could see to help us to respond to any kind of danger quickly. If I had you do a race and I had some of you run on all fours down the hall and some of you were able to just run on two, who's going to win? I mean, most likely those that have two, right? So we're a lot faster. We could go further more easily. Bears are really good at making themselves look scarier, even though bears are pretty scary on their own, that if you encounter a bear and it's all walking around, and it sees you, it goes, and it sticks its hands up, shows its claws, and it looks much bigger than it is. So we look a lot bigger. If something was coming at us, we could be like, we can look scarier. It also allowed for culture or, oh no, sorry, we're getting into another section. So culture, um, let me talk about that. Most primate groups show very cultural systems. You could teach each other things by using your tools, right? You could use the wall of the cave to teach about this is good and this is good and this is good. And then you could draw what's not good or leave a note, I'm going out. I'm gonna be gone for two days. I'm gonna go hunting. You could teach each other things like where to go, make maps, you could go to other regions of the world. And then like I mentioned before, you could live in a group and you could assign jobs. All right, question. This is a skull of what? Okay, good, that's an ape for sure. Good, good. And then, uh, no, where, now I don't have the second question. How do you know? <laughs> yeah, all those things. You could see all of those things in our skull that you see here. All right, so a little bit about human evolution then. We're on to the last tiny bits and that's just us, right? A little bit, a little bit of humans in evolutionary time. Uh, one of the first human-like species was called Salianthropus chidensis. They lived only, only six million years ago. So remember, in the grand scheme of that clock, we're like seconds old maybe even a second old in that idea of the clock. 
Sarianthropus has still a lot of ape-like characteristics. Thalanthropus was still stooped. They were really furry. The first human ancestors were small. We got bigger over time. So a lot of times we don't realize that. Artipithecus remittus, about four to six million years ago. They're still studying them. They've only found partial skeletons, so they're still learning about Artipithecus. And then we have a mutation for being upright. And the earliest homonyms looked like this. Still have a big snout, furry body, longer arms, shorter legs. But in Africa about 4 million years ago, Australopithecus afarensis was upright. So sorry, and I, again, don't have this in here, but make sure you note this is the first upright human ancestor. So this is, if you just kind of like take your time to, to sound it out, Australopithecus. Australopithecus. First upright, first bipedal, still little. We're probably mostly herbivores and scavenged a lot because they were little. They weren't very big yet. So they scavenged what they could. Eventually the Australopithecus genus dies off. The homo genus at the end, kind of they overlap a little bit in time. The homo genus survives and eventually gives rise to us. So let's take a look at the homo genus and kind of the orders of our different ancestors. So about 2.5 million years ago, we have that common ancestor that splits off. The earliest, one of the earliest is homo habilis. They label this Homo habilis as the handyman. Oh, and one thing to let you know. When um, we're writing in science and you say the first time I should, I should underline because I'm writing. The first time that it's written, the scientific name is written, you write the full name. And then after the first time, you can shorten the genus name to the first letter period. So when you see something like this, it's just because this is already mentioned and you know it, and now you can shorten it. I just want to mention that. Uh, Homo habilis, there's a lot of anthropological research that shows that they used a lot of tools. So that's why they call that the handyman, because lots and lots of tool use then. They were a little, they're a little bit bigger, but they still looked kind of disproportionate and very hairy. What we're seeing over time is we're seeing lengthening of the body, shortening of the arms to become more proportional. Um, getting the brain bigger and the face flatter and the teeth smaller and the jaw smaller. So all of those things. Homo ergaster came from Australopithecus about 2 million years ago. They were a little bit more proportionate. They think this is the one that would have had a common ancestor with Australopithecus. So remember, we don't have species come from species, they share a common ancestor, and then they start to go in different environments and experience a process of natural selection independently. So when people say like this evolved from that, that's not the right wording. 
It's they had a common ancestor. And remember that picture of divergent evolution is that with a common ancestor, they go into different environments to reduce competition and they experience the process of natural selection differently. That's what we're talking about. Homo erectus was called the fire user because anthropological research shows that there were a lot of fires made there. This is key because the use of fire shows that they can learn how to warm themselves in colder environments. So they start to move out of warm Africa. We see the movement of humans out of Africa. Homo ergaster also had a common ancestor with Homo heidelbergensis. You have to recognize them, yes. You have to, and, and I'll, I'll explain in a second, but definitely, like, you want to know that um, Homo habilis is the tool user. Homo ergaster is the fire user. Homo ergaster had a common ancestor with Australopithecus. So, kind of. You don't have to worry about spelling them out. They'll be on the exam. So just recognize and... Homo heidelbergensis gives rise, they have a common ancestor with the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis. It was thought that the Neanderthals were a Homo sapien, but then anthropological research actually relatively recently, like maybe uh, eight years ago or so, um, found out by running DNA that they found in the bones that they could still utilize showed that they are a different species than Homo sapiens. Homo heidelbergensis also has a common ancestor with Homo sapiens. That's you. All right, a little bit about Neanderthals. Um, Neanderthals They've been depicted like this because they had really big skulls. For some reason, if you, if you want to look at like a really vintage, vintage, vintage cartoon about the Neanderthals, um, watch Captain Caveman. If you look it up, it's um, silly. But the Neanderthals got labeled as cavemen because they did. There was a lot of anthropological research to show that they did live in caves. Uh, but somehow we got labeled as stupid. But if you had a bigger brain, would that not indicate more intelligence, hypothetically? So it's kind of interesting in that. They did have like a weird ridge on their heads, which gives you an advantage for like headbutting, make it hurt more. So there's a lot of misconceptions about the Neanderthals. And again, a lot of research that's happened in the last maybe like decade that's given them a distinction of being their own species. And they were around Europe. Um, and people say, well, if they were smarter, why did they go extinct? Well, it could have been a virus. Could have been a virus in Europe. <laughs> Wiped them out. Something in the climate changed quickly and they died out. Something they're still trying to figure out. Uh, they do see even more, maybe I would say not more interesting, but a lot of very interesting cultural traits that they've studied with the Neanderthals as well but again, supports the fact that they weren't stupid. But, but they were bigger than us. They were bulkier. Um, if, you, if you run any of those DNA tests, they'll tell you like what percentage of Neanderthal you might have in you. So if you're somebody who has like a really big skull and is like more big boned, you might have some Neanderthal DNA where the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens actually like um, got together. Okay, so here's the trend again. As we go from Homo ergaster all the way to Homo sapiens, we have a trend in the body size gets bigger. Brain size gets bigger. Skull size, brain size. We see a lot more cultural things, tool use, tool making. Ability for teaching and moving around the, the earth, making fires. And we just like look more modern human, less hairy, more proportionate body to arms to legs, flatter face, 
smaller jaws, smaller teeth. So this might be a question. You might want to start this also, is that I like these order questions. Instead of making you memorize dates and times and that, I like to say just know who came before whom and whom and whom. Okay, so if we're taking a look at these, B or C? Uh, C? C good? Ashpagat, Irrigaster, Rectus, Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So what I would do on this right here is I, if I were you right now, I would trace Australopithecus afarensis to Homo ergaster to Homo heidelbergensis to Homo sapiens. That's our lineage. So you might want to put some heavy lines like this. Because another question I like to say is, what is the lineage of the Homo sapiens? It's Australopithecus afarensis to Homo ergaster to Homo heidelbergensis to Homo sapiens. All of these other lineages, they, they died off for whatever reason, some kind of climate change issue. Climate changed, they weren't favored, they died off, okay? All right. Thank you for hanging in with me for this unit. I know that day off really made this harder. So well done. Um, just please, all of you, please, if you have not finished writing up your objectives, get them done today. Get them done. Don't use writing up the objectives as study time. That is prep time for studying. You got to get those objectives done so that you can review and quiz, review and quiz. Couple, wait, hold on, no late. Couple recommendations, okay? Let's let's talk about the way you should be behaving in terms of studying the next, you got five days. You should sit at a desk, in a chair, in quiet, no phone. Put that phone away. No music, no streaming, no apps, no social media. You have to learn how to be quiet. Chunks, chunk up your studying. Do not try and study for eight hours the night before. That is scientifically bad. If you are someone who says, I work well under pressure, you know why you work well under pressure? Because you have to. We actually do better. Like, remember how I've been saying this whole unit? Write up your objectives, review, start studying, quiz, review, Review, quiz, review, quiz. And you should have been doing this the whole unit because that is the best way we learn. So don't convince yourself, I work good under pressure. I like to wait till last minute. You will produce better products when you start earlier. You will. Chunk it out. Allow yourselves, whatever like really works for you, 30 to 50 minutes is a good like sit and focus and study. Choose to check your brains in, because I have a hard time with that. I sit down and I could be reading something and I'm reading for 10 minutes and then I'm like, I gotta go back. I don't know what the heck I read, right? Does any of you have that problem, right? Make sure you cognizantly go, okay, I'm gonna get rid of everything else in my brain and I'm going to choose to focus on biology. And when you have another thought, you push it out of your brain. You gotta cognizantly make those choices to study and focus, it's so hard. So sit. You can make a timer. You can put your phone on the other side of the room, put a timer on, whatever works for you. Figure out the timing issue. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, somewhere in there is the best short period. That's a short period of study time. Make a timer, choose to focus, review, quiz, review, quiz, take a break, but not like a half hour break for every half hour. Half hour studying, five minute break. 50 minutes studying, eight minute break. I'm gonna study for a half hour. I'm gonna give myself social media for five minutes. I'm gonna go to the restroom. I'm gonna use social media. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna play a game. I'm gonna watch five minutes of this, okay? So give yourself a reward. We love rewards. We do better. So plan, chunk it out. Reward system for you. Um, 
make sure you quiz, make sure you're quizzing yourself on the objectives. Test anxiety or bad test takers usually do not check in to see, do I know what I think I know? Every student I've had who comes to me and says, I knew everything. And then I start asking them questions and they know hardly anything. And then I say, tell me how you studied. And they never quiz themselves. Quizzing builds so much confidence in you that you know you know what you know. Not, I think I know what I know. It is key, 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 key. It will reduce test anxiety, it will make you a better test taker, and it will reduce the amount of stupid mistakes. How many times have you read a question and you're like, oh, I didn't even recognize that was in there? Because you just, your brain is all like, ah, this is not like how I studied, so I'm freaking out. So mimic, train for the exams. Do well on this first exam, please. Start off the semester great. Don't be like, oh, it's only the first exam. You don't want to be climbing back from a bad first exam. You want to like kill it. Whatever y'all say is good. Okay, so just my little pep talk. Sorry if you think I'm always on a soapbox, but I know things. <laughs>